Hi, I'm Thomas Tulak, and you're listening to Pop Culture Addicts. Welcome to Pop Culture Addicts, the weekly show that brings you interviews and discussions with people in our pop culture world. You know, that means we get to talk more about movies, more music, more video games, and more. <laughs> Don't miss a week. You never know who's going to be our next guest. So, okay, addicts, are you ready for your pop culture fix? Welcome to Pop Culture Addicts. Our guest today is an actor who got his start at the tender age of six in this business as one of the Lost Boys in Steven Spielberg's Peter Pan adaptation called Hook. Very popular movie. A lot of us have seen it. A lot of us grew up with that movie. But since the days of being the character too small, he's gone on to become a director, a writer, and a musician. So I am very pleased and honored to welcome Thomas Tulak to Pop Culture Addicts. Welcome to the show, Hi. Thomas. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm very, very excited to talk to you. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. So one of the things that we pride ourselves on doing here on the show is that we like to make sure that we do our due diligence when it comes to uh, doing research and finding out about the guests. And especially when I found out that you were a musician, because I always like to find out what music people are are creating. I, I love music. There's always a bit of a soundtrack going. I'm a little worried that I just did this next to my head. Um, <laughs> There's a soundtrack going, but you don't like musicals. That's different, entirely different. <laughs> but is it? <laughs> oh, it is. It's completely different. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Metallica and Megadeth aren't playing in most musicals. Anyway, <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he yet, anyway. they, they are all older gentlemen now with kids. You never know. It I mean, they did a Queen musical. Anyway, so uh, I was out looking around the, the interwebs, and I found some of your music out on, on Reverb Nation. And immediately, the nerd in me had to stop and listen to a song because the title of the song amused me, I Am Groot. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but even more so, the name of the band amused me more, Deep Thought, spelled T-H-O-T. Now, okay. Let me, let me, uh, real quick. So, um, Deep Thought, uh, was, it's, it's a, it's a project where I play all the instruments. I, uh, write all the music and, and engineer it. Basically it's my own kind of little side passion project, but here's the thing. I have been doing that, making music under that name or with that, uh, model for a while now. And when I first put that, uh, together, under the name Deep Thought, it was a reference to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And then when I started posting music under that name, it has been informed to me that the, <laughs> the, the, term, the term thought, spelled T-H-O-T, means something entirely other. So I have since then changed the name of this uh, musical project from Deep Thought to Giant Robots in the Sky. So... <laughs> If you go that. to, thank you, if you go to you know, any one of the music streaming platforms, Spotify, iTunes, whatever, you'll find two albums under the name Giant Robots in the Sky that feature myself playing all of the instruments. Okay. I'm okay with that. Just over here Googling <laughs> what the other thing means. Nothing? Nope. Ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I saw the name of, uh, of Deep Thought and it, and honestly, it, it made me chuckle a little, a little giggle. I did not even think of Hitchhiker's Guide. I thought of the other thing. Uh, and <laughs> See, whereas I went Hitchhikers, because that's where no, my brain no. goes. And then you're, then you're like, oh, and then the other thing. And I'm like, wait, what's the, oh, ooh, never mind. Oh, something entirely other than never I was not, not trying to go there. So Hitchhikers that is over way. here. Yes. Thought is over here. The, uh, yes. <laughs> there goes diverged. the last yeah. amount of my innocence. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> completely divergent was, uh, from one another. Um, something I was completely unaware of when I started promoting <laughs> my music under that name. So I have to ask about the song, though. I am Groot. Sure. Okay. Is there a lyrical translation somewhere or a small trans, uh, trash panda to translate for us? Uh, you, you would actually, uh, you'd have to study Groot. Um, they take it as an elective on Asgard, though, so. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked diligently with a translator, um, but I told what, like, the mood that I wanted and, and where I was trying to go with the lyrics, and what I got back is what the song is, so. I loved it. Actually, I thought it was very entertaining. 
So thank you. <laughs> so Tim graciously told me that he would save all of the hook nostalgic questions for me since okay. <laughs> it was one of my favorite movies and still is one of my favorite movies. We watched it like less than a month ago and my three-year-old thought it was the best thing ever because pirates and sword fights and who doesn't love it? Right. So I've realized though that growing up watching it and now watching it as an adult, that movie does not get old at all. And watching as a watching it as a kid, you relate to the Lost Boys. Watching it as an adult, you realize you start to relate to Peter, and you're like, "Oh, wait a minute! No, I want to be the Lost Boy. I want to go back mm -hmm. to that. What <laughs> happened to me?" Right. But I love Too Small. Oh, he's my favorite. He's always been my favorite because I'm the youngest of four, and I was always too little to go do what my siblings were doing. Okay. So the line <laughs> at the end when Peter tells them to all look after somebody smaller than them. And you do the, well, who do I look after? The number bugs. <laughs> the little ones. I'm like, I adore that moment. Aww. And I'm just going to nerd out about that moment for a minute. But I've got, I've got a few hook questions that I've kind of combined into one. Okay. Because as a kid, what was it like? <laughs> what was it like getting to work with Robin Williams? I mean, that's a that's a huge, huge thing for this to be your first movie and then to be in a Steven Spielberg movie with Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. And it, that's those are huge names. But what was Robin like? Well, when you're six and seven years old, you really don't understand how big those names are. So I had no idea the gravity of the company that I was in. I just saw, you know, I saw Robin as Robin and he addresses you on your level, no matter what level you're on. So there's never any kind of, you know, ego or setting himself above or whatever. So in my eyes, Robin was always just like, you know, a buddy, like the big brother that I never had. I'm the oldest in my family. And so I don't have a big brother. And so, yeah, Robin was just kind of like my big brother, like, my, the best times I had on set were hanging out with him off camera. Like we were playing, uh, we had, this is back in, you know, before wireless games and whatever. So we had Game Boys that you had to connect with a three foot table. And so we would hang out and play video games together. And I'd connect my Game Boy to his and, you know, we would play or we'd play basketball. There was a basketball court outside the, by the trailers. And, you know, we were just hanging out and having fun. And I didn't know until I was much older like who he was, you know, and, and who all the people that were on, the, there were a lot of big names on that mm -hmm. set. And I had no idea until I was older and could understand uh, a little bit more what exactly all was happening. So yeah, yeah Robin was just, uh, he, he was like the best friend and the best big brother that you could ever want. All the things that you hear about him, about how wonderful he is there. It's all true. That's so cool. That's so cool. I mean, because, we all we all love him. We all adore him. We loved his movies. We loved his work. And I can only imagine how cool it would be to get to say, hey, I knew him. No, oh, yeah. I got to work with him. Like very cool. And it's it, he's always held and to this day and until I die, a special place in my heart. Um, just for you know, being he was the kind of like he genuinely was enriched by bringing happiness to others. See, he wasn't trying to, you know, he wasn't trying to advance a cause or anything. He genuinely just liked making other people smile and laugh and feel good. And, you know, that's who he was. And, and that's, that's something I'm going to take with me for the rest of my life. That's so cool. That is so cool. So, I mean, you said that it wasn't until you were older that you realized how, how cool that was, how many of those big names you were working with. Are you still in touch with any of the former cast members? I mean, it's been over 30 years at this yeah. point. <laughs> I like to think that some of them might remember me, uh, but really the only ones that I've had any contact with are some of the other Lost Boys. Um, there was one Lost Boy, um, Pockets, mm -hmm. um, Isaiah Robinson, who is close to my age. And he and I were kind of like good friends on the set. And so he and I have more or less kept in contact over the years. And then I've, you know, I've had contact with or seen some of the other Lost Boys here and there. I, I went to lunch with James Madio a while back and I was on Dante Bosco's film set recently, uh, a few years ago. I, recently, <laughs> it was a few years back. It wasn't recently, but 
there's this whole weird pandemic thing that's made time not make any sense. You know, it's really true. <laughs> but uh, Dante was producing a, a fan film Rufio sequel, yeah, or a prequel, Ooh. I'm sorry, prequel, not not sequel, prequel. Uh, a prequel telling the story of how Rufio gets to Neverland. Mm-hmm. And um, he was producing it and he invited me to hang out with him on set. And um, they were going to work in a cameo for me have if they had time, which they didn't have time, but... Hi. That's okay. It was fun to hang out, and, and Jim Hart was there, who uh, who wrote the screenplay, and just it was fun to be there and see what they were doing and be a part of it. Um, so you know, there's that. That's uh, out on on YouTube. It's been out for a while now. It's called Bangarang, uh, the Rufio prequel, which it's a, it's a fun little it's a fun little thing. You know, if you're a fan of Rufio, so, That's so cool. That's really cool. I will have to check that out because I am a fan of Rufio. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, they're mostly just the other Lost Boys. I don't I haven't really um, reached. I haven't really contacted, uh, been in contact with anyone else. I did speak to Robin on the phone, probably oh gosh, ten years ago. I reached out to maybe a little bit more than ten years ago. I don't know, like two thousand nine, ten, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. I had reached out to uh, you know his his manager and just kind of said, yeah, this is who I am. I just wanted to get back in touch with my old friend and one afternoon he kind of just calls my cell phone and I sit and talk with him for about 20 30 minutes so oh, and that was fun yeah. but uh but that's basically it that's still really cool that's so still cool. yeah you still right. got to talk to Robin Williams I mean. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so Thomas being a father I'm I'm big into uh dad jokes and wordplay and which is also why I think I like the deep thought reference earlier uh but i also okay. noticed on your imdb list that there was a movie called uh done 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 it or who done 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 it which also yes. made me laugh because all i could think of then was the the music dun 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 you know in, in murder mysteries <laughs> um and i may have been walking around my house all day going dun 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 honestly it's I, more than i want to admit but i was originally going to ask you about that but then the star wars nerd in me told me that I have to ask you about your fanfic that you made um, <laughs> called The okay. Saber, which I found to be really interesting because it's it, it's set in, in like modern time Earth, which, mm-hmm. you know, out of all the fan films I've ever seen, and I've watched a lot of Star Wars fan films, because if it's pretty much if it's Star Wars, I'm going to watch it. I, I'm going to need to uh, take that into my brain somehow. And, but... I've never seen one that was set in modern day earth. And, you know, the, I thought the story behind it was kind of both really interesting, but also kind of a, um, kind of a play on, on our modern world and where kind of some things are at, where, where did you come up with the story from? Cause it credits you as the writer and the director. Where did you come up with the story mm-hmm. from and, and how did you go about making it? Well, for, first of all, don't ever be uh, ashamed to sing "Dun Dun Dun" it because that's <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that at all. Especially considering that the the film is called "Who Dun 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 It," and it is actually a murder mystery, and it is the play on that that uh, accent, that musical accent. Dun Dun Dun. That's exactly what the film is. Who Dun 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 It? So. Perfect. Uh, and I'm, uh, that's something I've been um, working on uh, now. It's my current project. I'm in uh, post-production on that, which will be the first feature film to carry my name as writer and director. So awesome. hit that nail right on the head. <laughs> but uh, for the Sabre, um, yeah. So I, I wanted to bring the world of Star Wars into the, my world, essentially. So um, I've, I've been a huge Star Wars fan since I was a small kid. Um, you know, I used to, like everybody else, grab whatever thing I could, and it's a lightsaber, and I'm doing all that. So, but it's always, Star Wars has always been away from Earth. You know, it's on another right. planet and galaxy far, far away a long time ago and all that. So I wanted to tell a Star Wars story that brings it into my world into the world that i see so yeah it's uh it plays on the idea that the events of star wars actually happened a long time ago in another galaxy and we are now in the future from what that was from that that 
those events. And so in within the world of the, of the story, the war between the good side and the bad side continued until the bad side eventually won and Jedi are outlawed and or Jedi are extinct and use of the force is outlawed and the empire is just rolling through the galaxy, conquering planet after planet with nothing to stop them. And now they have reached Earth and they are taking over Earth. But they're so all of the characters are, you know, they have an earthbound appearance. And so instead right. of, you know, lasers and blaster guns, they're wielding pistols with bullets. Right. And instead of looking like stormtroopers, they're looking like SWAT team members. Right. And yeah. And so my my uh, my Darth uh, my Darth Vader type character Darth Van Aiden, instead of wheel you know full body armor, he's got a ankle length trench coat, leather trench mm-hmm. coat, like you would have seen in you know World War Two or something. And so uh, my um, my Sith my Emperor character is uh, an old white guy in a suit. You know, so I, I took yeah I I took it into this were our world and then within this world um with the good with the uh dark side just kind of reigning supreme they uh they find a lightsaber and they discover that the the main character discovers she can actually feel the force and wield a saber and conquer some bad guys and so yes i uh, i wrote it directed it and edited it and um i'm very proud to be trying to you know promote it and get it out there it's been in a few festivals, and I'm trying to get it into Comic Con, but I haven't heard back from them. <laughs> One of the things I found most interesting, you, you mentioned the 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 main character there, is that you know, and I'm spoiler alert for anybody who's going to watch it later. Um, <laughs> so you know, maybe like you know, earmuffs or something. Uh, but <laughs> I thought we'll it was, an ending of a spoiler warning up on the screen. It'll be there. Okay. You go. <laughs> I, I thought it was kind of interesting though that at first she went to try to try the saber when you know it was first brought into her home. And she was like scared to touch it, and, and then it wouldn't work. And like she reached over and hit the button, nothing mm-hmm. happened. And it was almost like a sense of relief. She did a really mm-hmm. good job of emoting that that there was a sense of relief that okay, I can't do it, so it's it's not me. I won't get in trouble. And then you know, <laughs> in, in the in the moment when it was needed, you know, then she was able to use the force. I thought that was mm-hmm. a really cool way of doing it. Plus, you know, the way that she defeated the bad guy. I also kind of like. No, thank thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, we uh, we played into some deep. Uh, you know, canon in in the world that the uh, the Kyber crest crystal inside the lightsaber connects to the wielder through the Force, mm-hmm. and so I played with you know if if Force has been outlawed and Jedi's are extinct and nobody ha- can can make that connection through the Force to the Kyber crystal, then maybe the Kyber crystal that is a bit alive, according to you know Star Wars canon. Uh, right. maybe they close down in on themselves mm-hmm. and kind of just shut down. And so it, in, in the world of my film, it requires somebody who is force sensitive for it to sense that connection and activate. So if you're not force sensitive, you can't turn on a lightsaber. And so while she is force sensitive, um, the main character, she doesn't know it yet. So right. the first time she tries to turn it on, yeah, she, she isn't aware of that connection. She doesn't make it. And so she tries to turn it on and it doesn't turn on. But it's after, yeah, her, her, we're talking spoilers, but yeah, later on when it is needed, she, uh, she feels it and the force kind of comes to her aid and there you go. Yeah, absolutely. No, I thought that, I thought that was a really cool way to do it. I thought, um, you know, cause a lot of times when, when, uh, watching some, especially when it comes to, to fan films, uh, sometimes the, the story isn't very well laid out. So you don't, you don't understand the 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 hero's journey and her being the hero of the film you know you don't under it was easy for her me to understand rather her journey and how she got to where she was at and why now the force was active in her uh where i've seen other fan films where it's just like you know they walk up yeah i'm the hero here we go there we go let's do this you know uh but i thought it was really nice how you played into that and that the force had to become activated and so well done man other fan films thank you, thank you so the much sequel trilogy <laughs> yeah. Listen, well the sequel trilogy is a whole other conversation. <laughs> that's a whole um, other conversation yeah <laughs> But yeah, it was it was very important to me uh, to do exactly that. Before I made this, I watched a lot of fan films, and there are a few things that I noticed. A lot of them are they seem 
lacking in the story department. Maybe they're just an excuse to have a lightsaber duel or show off some special effects techniques or whatever, but the story is a little lacking mm-hmm. or, and I'm not calling out any specific fan no, films. No. There are a lot of great ones out there. But Completely understood. Well, another, yeah, yeah. But uh, another thing that I kept noticing was that uh, a lot of the acting was not very good. And so I wanted to, I, I set out to make one that put the story first and featured talented actors. And I happen to know a lot of talented actors that were more than, because they're all Star Wars geeks too. So mm-hmm. they were all, they're all great actors in their own right. And they were all, you know, willing to come in and like, yeah, let's do a thing. And so it was done for a, a very small budget that, so I don't, I'm not showing off a lot of special effects. Right. I'm putting the story first and, and acting. And it's exactly like you said, I wanted to, to the audience to be able to understand, you know, what's driving the main character and everything. And to that point, the film is 20 minutes long and the lightsaber duel is only like a minute and change. Right. So most of what's happening is story and character development and world building. And that was kind of uh, exactly my goal from the onset when I first started writing the script is to do exactly that. You know, so So thank you. Yeah, no problem. (laughs) So Kathleen and I actually host another show called Funny Science Fiction Podcast, and we do a live show every Monday night. And actually, Monday night, we were talking about science, you know, uh, clearly science fiction, but Star Wars in general. And we were talking about how a lot of the times, the most of us that were on the panel that night agree that most of the times we enjoy Star Wars more when there's less use of, of the lightsaber, when there's less use of force, when there's actually a story being told. And that's honestly one of the reasons why I love Rogue One so much, is that it's it's very well written. There's, there is some, you know, lightsaber use, there is some force use, but it's a minor part of the story. We're, we're learning all these other things. And I thought that was something that you also kind of tapped into. Yeah. There's a lightsaber there. Um, you know, most of the time that the lightsaber is used, it's just that like, you know, the, uh, the one kid's holding it up or somebody's holding it and, and with it lit up. And like you said, there's a very small lightsaber battle. So I thought that that was really cool where it wasn't, you know, the, the staple, because a lot of fan films, it's just, it's, you know, hey, I this guy learned how to do some, some you know, some really neat flip, uh, you know, things that he could do with his lightsaber and, you know, make it look cool. And that's all great and good. And I enjoy watching those just as much as the next guy, don't get me wrong. But I also like a good story. And I thought that you did well with that. And so I, I really did appreciate the fact that it wasn't just all just, you know, so. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Speaking so. of lightsabers. Yes. Mine will be in the mail soon. <laughs> yeah. My husband got me a lightsaber. All right. Do you uh, do you know who you ordered from? Uh, Level Up Lightsabers. He's Ooh. our yeah. He's our affiliate for our other show. Um, so yeah. yeah, we're yeah. He's we're friends with Alan. Yeah, the owner of the so wait so. You guys, you guys have a working relationship with. Uh, we the guys have level up? a working yes. relationship with level uh, up lightsabers. Like, yeah. Light yeah. So he's he's a, our show partner for for a funny science fiction podcast. Oh, so you, you guys might have to con- connect me because we um, I actually collect lightsabers. We so will totally totally connect I'll, you. He I'll, just I'll, finished. I'll hook you up. <laughs> he just finished his pre-sale for his Zeopixel lightsabers. Oof. Okay. Which so are beautiful. He's got some cool stuff is, that is not the one that I got, but he was showing it off Monday night. And as he can do the full rainbow spectrum, just as like wow. <laughs> it's it's beautiful. It's, good. it's it good times. So pretty. I believe you. I've seen some of them on Instagram and things, and I've been looking into to level up like. That's that's yeah, that's uh, that's impressive. And I love that his his tagline, his selling point is that they're better than a stick. It, it's true. Right. As he smashes also... them up against like, you know, telephone poles and posts and all these things better than a stick and it won't break. Click, 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 click. Right. Okay. Like the, the base light ones, the base light ones are combat ready, combat okay. prepared or whatever. So like, yeah, he's got videos on TikTok and on Instagram of him smashing them into light poles. To, into polls. Wow. The Zeo Pixel ones, he's like, these are for cosplay because you don't <laughs> want to destroy the LED lights in it. And I'm be like, a little well, more careful with those. That, that be totally yeah, be aware. <laughs> but I, when you when you buy a lightsaber from him, you also get a year subscription to his online training class. Oh. Okay. 
That's really cool. Teaches you to use your lightsaber. It's pretty cool stuff. Really cool. I uh, I helped out a friend of mine um, on another uh, Star Wars fan film that they were working on, and um, as far as I know, I don't think it's uh, completed yet. I uh, it was it was kind of recent, but um, on that set they were using um, uh, I think they were just using um, ultra sabers, mm-hmm. lightsabers. Okay. Um, and the, the two guys that were dueling were fighting so hard. They ended up breaking like three blades. Oh, oh no. That gets yeah. expensive real quick. That, yeah. Ooh. So, so for him, for him to show off that those blades are a little bit more du- durable, like that, that says a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So as we have ventured down the path of nerdiness, <laughs> I that's what we do in my research in my research I've actually found a reddit post of yours from like seven years ago uh oh right like the <laughs> I love the concern oh god like, oh no <laughs> the reddit post itself was not like the the main concern to me I mean it was a it was an ask me anything post but okay. in that in your bio you mentioned you could talk Doctor Who for days. Ah, I can and indeed, yes. Coming from somebody who was dressed as River Song when my now husband proposed to me, okay, we had a TARDIS ring box at our wedding. I got super excited with the, yay, another Hoofian. I had, I I had a, a TARDIS um, cufflinks from my, oh. my uh, wedding tux. Awesome. I have, well a, I have a pewter TARDIS necklace that my husband bought me at the Ren Fest too. Like, I mean, it's it's a big thing. <laughs> so who's your favorite doctor? Who's your favorite companion? And they Ooh. don't have to be the two who travel together. Okay, okay. Um, oh, man. So I think um, Matt Smith edges out as my favorite. Mm. He's He has range. You know, he, he seeing him just, his performance is so just, layered and so mm-hmm. good and it was a it's been a tough call with the all of the uh the modern doctors uh david Tennant's really good i really like peter capaldi mm-hmm. um i i worry i feel like uh peter capaldi and jody whittaker have not had the best storylines to work with no. but as far as their performances they've been great um but yeah i gotta say and in a lot of the classic who, you know, is great. Like, I, I feel like second would probably be Tom Baker because you got to give it up for the classics. But right. I do feel like, yeah, Matt Smith edges out as my favorite. Just just enough. Just enough. When um, oh, companions. Oh, companions. Oh, man. I do like Rose. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, there's as much as I like Rose... Um, and and the tough kind of warrior she eventually becomes, I did kind of feel like there's there's a little bit of like toxic codependentness with Rose. Mm-hmm. So as great as Rose is, I might need to go with um, probably someone like Donna, who's a little bit more you know can stand on her own two feet mm. and, and kind of thing. Yeah. Um, or I like Amy and Rory too. Amy and Rory are a lot of fun. Yeah, and you got to have them both. You can't have one one right. without the other. Yeah, but yeah, they're a lot of fun, and their story that they have together it's uh, it's very heartwarming. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then again, I, it, if you're going to look at Romana uh, from Classic Who, who was also a Time Lord, so that's worth bringing up too. So true, and I like I liked Sarah Jane, and then I liked getting the Sarah Jane Chronicles too, mm-hmm. the the Sarah Jane spinoff. Um, yeah, it was also very good. And then a little tidbit, when uh, when the 11th Doctor appeared on the Sarah Jane Chronicles and he started talking about how he could regenerate, what was it? He said something like hundreds of times on there. It mm-hmm. was a joke, people. He can't really regenerate that many times. Right, right. We are running out of regenerations, yeah. but we're not because they'll find some reason that we're not. Exactly. <laughs> so my, my parents got me into Doctor Who when it came back in 2005. Okay. And... We had BBC America at that point. My parents had watched Classic Who. My mom's got a framed picture of Tom Baker. Like, I mean, it's it was a big thing. And so when when it came back and my dad's like, you gotta watch this. I'm like, why? <laughs> why? Mm-hmm. And that first episode with the nesting conscious and the the plastic, and I'm like, this is the stupidest thing <laughs> I have ever seen. This is so stupid. Yeah. Plastic Mickey in the restaurant. And I'm like, yeah, I can see. I can this is see. awful. This is, this is awful. 
Mm-hmm. The episode got over and I looked at my dad and I'm like, when's the next one? <laughs> like in in its terrible cheesy Britishness, I'm like, you got hooked right away. I need more. <laughs> yeah. I need yeah. more. So, yeah, for sure. But David Tennant's my favorite. Mm. Um, but I feel like Eleven's storyline is better. I think Eleven's storyline, yeah, is more succinct within itself. Mm-hmm. I, I uh, binged the show recently during the pandemic when I ran out of other things to watch. So I went back and watched it again for the hundredth time. Uh, but when you binge it, uh, and you get by the time you get up to Tenant and you get hooked into his, you get enthralled in Tenant's or I'm sorry, uh, Smith's um, overall story that is you know succinct from start to finish. You get connected into this ongoing storyline, and then it gets to Peter Capaldi, and that more or less kind of goes away, mm-hmm. and it goes back to the one-off uh, I think episodes that it had been previously, and it's it's hard to you know maintain that level of interest when it gets to that right. point because like you had you had the bad wolf storyline you had the who is river song storyline and i feel like they were trying to do that with clara and then yeah they fell apart they, they and fell apart pretty quickly yeah never really like i know i've seen the end of it i know that i've seen the end of her storyline mm-hmm. but i don't remember it I don't remember yeah. who she is or why she was important, or it just kind of fizzled into nothing with the, oh, oh mm, okay. It was very intriguing at first, the Clara storyline, you know, when they when they started hinting at, she, here she is, and then she died. Oh, and then here she is again, and she dies again, and like, and here she is again. Like, it's, that's the kind of mystery that keeps you in, but then by the time, right. yeah, that ends, it's like, oh, well, and then the game's over, seconds yeah. later. <laughs> So souffle girl is nothing or yeah. I, I, why? why? Yeah. 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 It goes back to, like I said, the, uh, the actors are great, but I feel like they don't have the best writing and stories to, uh, to work with. Um, and then there's, there's talk of babies coming back to write. I've heard, and I'm super excited. I feel like I that's going like, to make a difference. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I've not been very much on board with the Chibnall era. Um, it, it's, I have a lot of things that could be a whole other podcast, but I've got a lot of I haven't of even seen any of the Jodie Whittaker episodes yet. Like as much of a diehard Doctor Who fan as I am, it was the, I got lost halfway through Capaldi's mm-hmm. and I'm like, I, I don't. Hmm. I'm diehard enough that I've still, I'm still watching and I've still seen all of Jodie's seasons and I've seen every single episode that has come out. But um it's there are many episodes especially during Jodie Whittaker's era that I don't think I'll watch again Mm. and a lot of that is because of the writing because of the direction that Chris Chibnall has taken in the show and so I'm very excited to hear that uh Russell T Davies is coming back because Russell T Davies brings some epic storytelling that was there in the beginning it was largely because of Russell Davies that the show revised itself in 2005 from the beginning so right. yeah, i'm very excited to have him coming back and i mean like I, i'm working my way back through it and it's the i'm going to get through these episodes i am going to i am just getting to the end of amy and rory ah, again okay which is really hard yeah i hate that yeah but i'm like I, i'm getting there but then i have hbo and it's like hey you might also like i'm like oh yeah torchwood's on here too <laughs> yes. focus for five minutes it right <laughs> Stop it. But then I'm like, wait, what if I find online where the, the episodes are chronological and I I watch them in order like you do with Angel and Buffy? And it's like, no, no, mm-hmm. finish this, then that, mm-hmm, be mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. And Tim's over there with the la 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 la. I'm just waiting for you guys to start using your muggle words. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, the that's, sonic that's screwdriver the is a step away from a magic wand anyway. It's well, so see, it really go. is. That's, yeah, it's essentially <laughs> the same thing in my opinion, but you know. Because uh... Tim watched like the first episode. <laughs> Tim's seen, seen the Rose episode, and I think that's about it. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, There's so many good episodes. Of, if you're going to watch the show and just watch one episode, there are so many better ones to watch. Like Blink. Blink is, Blink is a classic example of a great first episode that just brings you right in. But there are so there's so many, sci-fi. so many well-written, really just gripping. I keep telling people that 
Doctor Who is some of the best television that you'll ever watch and some of the worst television you'll <laughs> ever watch. Well, I think yep. the couple episodes that I, I my wife likes Doctor Who. And I so I think a couple episodes that I've watched somehow happen to be the, the, the bad ones. Because I walked uh, in and I caught a couple minutes of it and I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm good. And yeah. <laughs> even even the, the Shakespeare episode with Ten and Martha. Yeah, it's um it's you know, kind of horrible. It kind of is horrible. That you gotta remember that when the show was originally created, it was meant as an educational thing. Like he he was kind of a teacher and he was a time travel so that he could go back and teach history. Mm-hmm. And so they have to keep some of that going with the show. So every season there'll be at least one episode where they go back in time and meet some famous historical figure. And those episodes where they're not always, there's not always room for some alien intervention, which is what the heart of the show is, they have to put that in though. So Mm -hmm. you're dealing with like the William Shakespeare episode, there's still aliens in it. Like, because there has to be, because it's a sci-fi thing. So, but it doesn't always need the aliens, you know? (laughs) Somehow the aliens are witches, but they're not. (laughs) Yeah. Now, consequently, if uh, if you set the weaker episodes aside and you look at the stronger ones like Blink or Midnight, for example. Ooh, Midnight's um, a good one. Oh, yeah, Midnight's such a good episode. There's so many really good ones that are just gripping and have you at the edge of your seat, you know? And so you kind of you kind of have to take the good with the bad, you know? Midnight's one of those that I forget about, and then I, I like, see it in the lineup, and I'm like, oh, right. I, I feel very strongly Midnight could make a live-action play, and I mm-hmm. would totally, I think that could be done very well. So, yeah. but yeah, you gotta, um, you gotta, if you're getting start, you gotta start with the right, Rose is not a great episode to start on. It's really not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Especially, yeah, coming into it with little knowledge, like, as the first introduction to the show, not so much. It's it's better once you've been connected to the show and then you go back and catch up just so that you can at least say you've seen all the episodes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think that the only reason that in 2005 it got me so much is I was 13. Mm. And so the the action adventure aspect of it got me. And then because I was a nerd being raised by nerds, mm-hmm. it was the, oh, wait, no, wait a minute, this is... <laughs> this is sci-fi like deep space nine and star wars and this is space and weird and i can do this i can <laughs> right. I can, I can get behind that i uh, i got into the show in the two-year gap between david Tennant and matt smith so david Tennant's era was done and they just haven't hadn't released matt smith's first season yet mm-hmm. and so as i'm getting into it i watch you know a bunch of david Tennant episodes and i'm just here for it everything i'm seeing and then i at, at once i'm in i go back and i rewatch. I, I just binge all of eccleston and tenant and so mm-hmm. when i when i go back and i'm watching uh rose i'm i'm seeing just how not very not great this episode is but i'm i'm noting it as i feel like the these this what this episode is dealing with i need to know for future episodes. Mm -hmm. So when they go back to this living plastic, I know what this is. Right. And then Matt Smith's season came out and uh, I just, oh my goodness, that was like a new level of genius there. And I full on fell in love with the show, like hardcore loyal forever kind of fell in love with the show. When they had episodes where he goes back in time to reference other episodes within Mm -hmm. the same, oh man, like, a, a, an explosion went off in my head and not only did it connect me to the show forever but it altered the way that I write my own writing and so now <laughs> since then I'm I'm because like I'm a, I'm a sucker for anything that's time travel and so I write time travel like it introduced me to a new way of thinking about time travel so absolutely like that that was like season five with Matt Smith is like the best season of the mm-hmm. show hands down I agree. Cool. <laughs> Real quick, before we change the subject, I will show my Hoovian tattoo. Ooh! <laughs> it's um, it's uh, old high Gallifreyan, you know, circular yes, Gallifreyan. It, is. it says the word time 
which also I'm like I said, I'm a sucker for anything time travel, but also time is the name of the first short film that I wrote and directed that got into a film festival. So oh, it's got like double so meaning. Cool. <laughs> And when that's you pulled super- up your sleeve, the first thing I saw was, ooh, Death Star. So, uh, oh. you know. <laughs> yeah. I get that a lot. Or like a steampunk Pac-Man or something like that. Yeah. Oh, hi, Gallifrey. It makes sense. It's yeah. just, you know, it's the Star Wars in me. I can't it's, help it. It's, it's a word in a fake language from a sci-fi show. Fair enough. I'm sorry, I, I know I'm, people who have tattoos in Elven, so it's. There you go. It sense. all works. I'm good with it. So back in 2017, uh, to change the topic uh, just a little bit here, or actually quite back a bit. to something that Tim actually understands. <laughs> back to the Muggle words. That's why I like to put it. Okay. Uh, back in 2017, you wrote a blog post on uh, this for the Shareable Film School and about being an indie filmmaker, and you talked about facing despair and loneliness in the pursuit of following your dreams. My goodness, you really do do your homework, don't you? Oh, we try. We really do try. <laughs> we call it research. It's virtual stalking, but we like to call it research. Uh, there's one line in that blog, though, that really stood out to me as an indie podcaster. So, and I'm hoping that you can expound on this just a little bit. In the in the uh, the blog, you said, once you decide what you want to do with your life, every decision that follows must be in support of that. So... What I'm hoping you can tell me is how has that proven true in your life and how do you encourage people to pursue their dreams while you're still working towards pursuing your own? Well, you know, it's it's like this. We're only given a finite amount of time on this planet. And that amount of time is very short in retrospect, you know? So on, on like... At most, any of us are given 80, maybe 90 years. And I think the average lifespan is a lot less. Right. And so, you know, so we have a limited amount of time. And when we get to the point where that time is running out, we're going to realize just how short it is, just how short it was. And so, you know, when you get to that point, do you want to look back on your life and realize that you spent it doing things you didn't want to do? Or do you want to look back on your life and be able to say that, you know, you, you had a thing that you wanted to do and you pursued it and you did it. And whether or not you make it is beside the point. I always tell people uh, the the only true failure is when you quit trying until then you just haven't made it yet, whatever it is that you're trying to do. And so it's like, we could easily just go get a job and go to work and work for somebody else and just live our lives that way. But do you want to keep doing something you don't want to do, you know, or do you want to pursue your dreams and try at least try and keep trying until you either make it or you die? You know what I mean? Right. So, so yeah. Um, in, in my own life, I, I've known ever since the days of Hook, watching Steven Spielberg do his thing that I wanted to be a director, I wanted to be a writer, I want to be a filmmaker. And uh, since that same time watching Robin Williams do his thing, I've known that I wanted to make people laugh, make people smile. And I I believe that laughter is the greatest gift anyone can give. And so my whole life I've known I want to direct and make movies that make people laugh. And So I've been doing that for the past more than a decade now. I've been making content in, you know, web shows, series, short films, whatever, um, and just doing it however I can, doing what it is that I want to do and trying, you know. And now I am making my first feature length movie that is a comedy that, uh, you know, and it's, it's like, this is my, I've decided that that's what I want to do. And anything else that I do with my life, any other decision that I make that is not in direct support of that is in opposition to that. So, you know, once you decide you want to do something, you either do it or you hurt it, you know? Right. So if you decide, if you decide you want to be a thing, you want to do a thing with your life and then you go do something else, you're taking away from that thing that you want to do. No one's going to do it for you. You're not going to get there by any other means than your own doing it. So it's time to get up and go pursue your thing and just make the decision and follow through because that's the only way you're going to get there. Cool. I like it. Awesome. <laughs> so again, in the, the researching, 
<laughs> it sounds way less creepy that way. Yes, okay. Put a pretty bow on it and you call it research and suddenly you don't get hit with um, personal protective. No things. worries. Right? I, I was a little worried when you brought up the shareable blog because I wrote for them. I wrote like weekly for shareable for like uh, um, six months. I don't remember a lot of the things I wrote. It was years ago. <laughs> so I was like, oh no, what is he going to ask? Fortunately, you, you touched on the one thing that's like a, a life motto of mine. So whew, but like, <laughs> you're safe. Yay. <laughs> but according to your biography on your IMDb, which says was written by you. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that this is accurate. You're also a newlywed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, we are hitting our one year anniversary Ooh. next month. Awesome. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you kindly. That is we, super exciting. My husband and I just celebrated our seventh anniversary in December and Tim and his wife are flipping amazing and celebrated 24 years. 24. Yeah. Wow. On Monday. Last one. Wow. Monday, which That's is impressive. Yeah. It's, incredible. It's, it's, yeah. Especially if you live with me, my wife's a saint. So uh, <laughs> she's amazing. Yes, she is. Tim's a butthead. <laughs> yes, I am. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so how has it been adjusting to married life while trying to navigate this wonderful global <laughs> pandemic? <laughs> so um, my wife and I have, uh, we've known each other going on six years now, I think. Um, and so we were friends for a number of years first, and then we dated for a uh, little over a year, year and a half, I think, something like that before we actually moved in together. And then we moved in together the very week the pandemic started. <laughs> oh boy. Same week. So literally it was like beginning of the week and we got the lease on our, on our place and end of that week and they're announcing the pandemic and stay at home orders and all of this. So from the moment the pandemic started, we had already been living together. Mm -hmm. And then we had plans to, you know, get married. And, and originally it was going to be the, the typical, you know, wedding with all your friends and family and church and all this and all that. But that those plans were pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit and it became, okay, well, we can't do that anymore. So we're going to put our wedding plans on hold until such time as we can do that. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic just kept going and kept going and kept going. And so eventually, you know, we hit a point where we're already living together. So we don't want to just, we don't know how much longer this pandemic is going to be. We don't know when we'll be able to get all of our extended family and everybody together in the same place again. Right. So we're just going to alter our plans. And instead we did a, we call it the COVID wedding where we just had um, her siblings and her father and my siblings and my father and, uh, that was it because those are the people that we were already having contact with on a regular basis anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just, uh, we got together and streamed it live for anybody who couldn't make it. And we just did a small little ceremony, COVID ceremony like that, um, which it was lightsaber themed. So hey. we had this part of this part of what started my, uh, my lightsaber collection. Cause we did one of those lightsaber arches that we go out underneath. Ooh. So we had like a dozen lightsabers in that. That's cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, so by the time the wedding was done and that was all said and done, and now I've got the ring on my finger, we kind of just, you know, we went home and went back to the same living together in a pandemic that we had already been doing <laughs> for oh, more than a year at that point anyways. So when people ask me, how's married life in a pandemic? It's like, well, it's not honestly all that different than living together in the pandemic was before the wedding. Right. <laughs> so, Fair enough. <laughs> I have been to three Zoom weddings since the pandemic started, which is crazy. It's it's weird. Like I have I have a friend who's already had her first wedding anniversary, and I'm like, I haven't even seen you in person <laughs> since you got married. This is bullcrap. Yes, yeah, yeah. I went to two, and like the second they turned around to to walk down the aisle, I'm sitting there with a Guinness. All right, let's do this. <laughs> right? Like, like. The Good only complaint I have is the, if you're sending out Zoom invitations, can you also like send out Grubhub? Can we, <laughs> can we still get our reception food? Cause there you go. This <laughs> Zoom wedding and then cooking my own dinner. Yeah. Kind of sucks. 
Surreal, Where is yeah. my cake? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, my my brother and sister in law got married in November of 2019. Oof. They had a long distance relationship. She lived in Arizona. We live in Michigan. Oh, that's rough. So they went from long distance relationship to freshly married, freshly living together. Pandemic. Now that is a culture shock. <laughs> it really was. And somehow it Fred's really still was. alive. And somehow Ooh. Fred's still alive. Yeah. <laughs> well, Fred got lucky. He really, really did. He really did. But then it's all of a sudden the pandemic. Fred works from home. It's like, oh, oh, you went from living time zones away from each other to flip, you're in a, a whole world upside down. Right you're in a two bedroom apartment stuck with that boy all the time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's a whole, whole new life a whole new the world. number of text messages i got from my sister-in-law and i'm like <laughs> uh-huh i lived with him for 22 years honey Mm-mm. yeah we were kind of hoping you could fix him right <laughs> we handed him we off to you. you this is yours yeah. now <laughs> oh, we warned you you said you wanted this mm-hmm. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> no, oh, I'm sorry. No, they're... dun dun dun. See more appropriate. There you go. <laughs> the fact that he's still alive is impressive. Yeah, but... no kidding. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I cannot imagine going from pandemic or going from casual dating to pandemic to. Yeah, your that's stuff. that is that's 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 a lot. That's a lot to have to deal with. Yes, it it is. Is. I, I suppose um, I'm uh, grateful that it happened for me and my wife the way that it did. Yeah. Um, because. The, the transition has been, you know, easy, <laughs> sure, yeah. especially compared to that, you know. I mean, it was hard enough for me with my daughter was 18 months old when the pandemic started. My mother-in-law lives with us. And so it was the, OK, well, we've got we've got grandma. We've got an 18 month old. We've got me and my husband. We're good. We can we can handle this. She's now going on three and a half. And it's the. No, that, that that right there is the kind of thing that just blows my mind. There are human beings born a living right now who know nothing but pandemic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's just mind-boggling my youngest nephew will be two in june and he's known nothing but people with face masks and people with face masks and and you can't hug your you know your grandparents and your uncles and aunts and like a whole world that is separated by six feet and that's just the pandemic has been something else it really has yeah it's been rough it's been rough for sure i have friends who it's the i haven't met their kids there i have friends who haven't met my kid it's like what what is this i met her kid and she's delightful (laughs) she is delightful (laughs) (laughs) on the plus side though we are going through this in a time where we have social media and the internet and zoom and things that allow us to stay connected when we can't be connected and so mm-hmm. like there we're living right now in the best possible time to have this pandemic could you imagine if this had happened back in the 90s when the internet was still new and we didn't have any of this well 14, and that's like 14 even... hours later after the handshake <laughs> <laughs> yeah no thanks we were watching it was my husband had this facebook post a week into the pandemic with we were watching Little House on the Prairie and they were quarantined for smallpox or something. I don't remember what it was. And they were talking about how it had been, it had been four days together. And I'm like, four days, <laughs> really? Really? But also that was four days with no TV, no internet, no phones. You are literally stuck with the people who live inside of your no walls. Running, no running water. Mm. That's a whole different, a whole different. At least here we can Grubhub and have dinner tonight delivered. There, there you like, go. Like, that's a whole, a whole other. I yikes. have hundred meg, hundred meg internet and Disney Plus. I'm good. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, Thomas. We have one final question for you, and we like to call it our silly question. We end every episode with this. Uh, okay. Every episode gets a different question. So tonight, your question is: If you could be a superhero, any superhero. Which one would you be and why? Does it have to be a superhero that exists? No. Or do I get you to, can, so I could be my own creation? Create your own, yes. You could be Super Thomas if you want. I don't care. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I would have the superpower, the ability to uh, telekinesis and telepathy. Mm. And... I would, so I could move things with my mind. I could read people's minds 
Um, but I would not like put on a costume and go out and fight crime. I would just be me and I would use these superpowers to my own advantage. So like, for example, I would, I don't know, uh, if I needed to lift something heavy or, or move or, you know, whatever it is that I'm trying to do, I have my secret telepathy that no one knows about to make it easier to do. Or I could trick the uh, accountant at the, at the bank to uh, slip some numbers or I'm kidding, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <But> <laughs> well, you sit down on your couch and realize the remote's across the room. Oh, exactly, exactly. Or, you know, <laughs> just float it across the room t- or just use my powers to turn the TV to whatever it needs to be. I would just use these powers to make my everyday life that much better when your Fair wife enough. says she's fine and nothing's upsetting her <laughs> exactly <laughs> I read the mind and figure out exactly what it is <laughs> yeah you just aquaman that situation just you know mm-hmm. so. mm-hmm. <laughs> sorry the or, number of times that that would have been so helpful right right i can i can read the mind and know what it was that upset her before it even upsets her and we avoid the whole thing in, in the beginning mm-hmm. is, you know, you know I, all the all the times when the husband says, I'm not a mind reader, well, I would be the mind reader and I would avoid the problem before it starts. Usually I know what I got in trouble for, but you know, there's been a couple of times, but 90% of the time I know. When, when you just come home with the, hey, I brought you what you wanted for dinner. Mm-hmm. There you go. Uh, before that, she um, even realizes what it was she wanted for dinner. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, no more of this. Hey, what restaurant do you want to go to? Exactly. 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 Oh, uh, Thomas, we have enjoyed talking to you so much today. Where can our viewers and our listeners go to find out more about your work and just you in general? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I've been, this, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at, at tn 2 lock um, or you can go over to my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Thomas Tulak, um, or you can find me on Facebook, uh, Thomas.Tulak, I think it is on Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter, but I don't really use Twitter all that much. So, but I think it's at TN2 Lock there too. Okay. <laughs> we will definitely link all of those. We will find them for you and double check and make sure that you got them right and then link them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that yes. so you can find you. Yes, there you go. <laughs> all right. We want to remind everybody too that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help our show continue to grow and to make sure that we get more amazing guests like Thomas Tulock here today to have these great stories and, and uh, share a few laughs with. So please subscribe. It's that little button down there somewhere down the bottom. It's going to pop up on the screen too. But anyways, only hit it. the editor put it this time. Yeah, it, <laughs> it moves around on the screen. Anyway, only hit it once. If you hit it twice, it undoes all the fun. Uh, so remember, kids. Pop culture is all around us. It influences every part of our lives, everything that we do. So be sure to come back next week because we'll have your fix waiting right here for you on Pop Culture Addicts. <laughs> Thanks again, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Bye, buddy. Hey, thanks for listening to Pop Culture Addicts. If you're interested in being a guest on a future episode of Pop Culture Addicts, you can reach us on either Instagram or Twitter by using the handle at PCA Pod Show. You can also email us at PCA Pod Show at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Copyright 2021 Pop Culture Addicts. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of by Pop Culture Addicts or any of its sponsors. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity that they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at PCAPodshow at gmail.com.